Hi ladies and gents, this time we're going to talk about kinetic energy and potential energy. But we're going to begin with our discussion of kinetic energy. Kinema means motion, like going to the cinema. And so kinetic energy is the energy an object has due to its motion. The equation for kinetic energy is this. Kinetic energy is one half mass velocity squared. Kinetic energy is measured in joules, mass, kilograms, and velocity, our old friend, meters per second. Now, the equation, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, says some interesting things about how these terms are related. So one of the things it says is that kinetic energy is directly proportional to mass. What does this mean? This means that if you have a heavy thing in motion, the heavy thing in motion is going to have more kinetic energy than the light thing having the same speed. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, I've been driving a car for a very long time, and I don't know about you, when I see a stop sign coming up, I do some mental math and I kind of know when I should start stepping on the brakes so that I can ease to a stop when I hit the stop sign. Many years ago, my husband and I bought a big camper, big camper, and uh, he has pulled horse trailers most of his life, and I have not, and so he hooked it up to the vehicle, and he said, okay, Mary, go forth and learn how to drive this thing, and I live way out in the country, and I'm tootling along. Well, I get to my very first intersection down at the end of our road where there's a stop sign, and same mental math I did before a stop sign with my just my car, all of a sudden I've got many, many thousands of pounds back behind me that I had not counted on. With these extra thousands of pounds, I hit the brakes at my normal spot that I'd hit the brakes, and what happened? I went wee and I kind of went coasting through the intersection. Um, kind of scared the wadden out of me, and I learned an awful lot about mass and its relationship to energy. Because I had so much extra mass and it was in motion, it was going to take me a lot further to stop. Here's another example. If you throw a tennis ball at 10 meters per second, it's not a lot of energy. A dog can catch it and has a good time catching it. But if you take a medicine ball, which is a big beast that weighs lots and lots and lots of pounds, it's kind of like throwing a bowling ball around, it's going to take a lot more energy to stop this. Um, it's like kind of maybe 10 times or 50 times more, and that's why people use them for exercise and fitness. So there's a direct relationship between mass and energy. There's also a relationship between kinetic energy and velocity, but it's not a direct proportion. It's actually to the squared term. So what that means is if you double velocity, you end up with four times the kinetic energy. If you triple velocity, nine times the kinetic energy. 4 times the velocity, 16 times the kinetic energy. Let's go through a couple examples. If I toss a coin at something small, like 4 meters per second, it doesn't have an awful lot of mass, but it's a small thing, and I'm moving it at a slow speed. It has a very low kinetic energy, and I can catch it, and it doesn't hurt at all. You take something similar in size, a piece of metal that is about 1 gram, like a bullet, but in, you make the velocity 100 times greater at 400 meters per second, which is right around 1,200 feet per second, which is about the speed of a 22 bullet, and all of a sudden you've got something that can be lethal. It's just an increase of speed, but the energy doesn't go up just with the speed. It goes up with the speed squared. So a small change in velocity, big change in energy. Another place that you see this is stopping distance in vehicles. So for example, let's say I have a car going um, 50 miles per hour. At 50 miles per hour, the stopping distance, now this first yellow bit, that is thinking distance. That's human reaction time. Your constant velocity while you are going, oh my goodness, I need to stop. So that's what's going on with this yellow section. In the blue section, this is actually the brakes. You step on the brakes, and the brakes are going to transform motion, velocity, into heat. Well, if you're going 50 miles an hour, you need about 38 meters to stop, which is just around 38 yards. 10 miles an hour more, 
So we're not talking double, we're talking only 10 miles an hour more, or 10% more velocity for 60 miles an hour than 50. And what's the stopping distance? The stopping distance isn't twice as much, but boy howdy, it's around 40% more. And that's just nutty. The tiny 10 mile per hour change in speed gives you a 40% more stopping distance. If you are at 60 miles an hour, it takes 55 meters. You go up another 10 miles an hour, you go up to 75 meters. Big, 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 big stopping distance. So kinetic energy doesn't go up just with velocity. It goes up with velocity squared, small change in speed, big, big change in energy. Potential energy. So kinetic energy is energy of motion. Potential energy is the energy an object has due to its position within some sort of a reference frame that you, the problem doer, decides upon. The equation for potential energy is this. Potential energy is mass, height, times the acceleration of gravity. Now, acceleration of gravity, I like to write A sub G because I want everybody to understand that acceleration of gravity is just a special situation for acceleration. By historically, and in most textbooks, you're going to see potential energy is mass, height, acceleration of gravity, and they have a tendency to use lowercase g. Please don't let that throw you. Acceleration of gravity is the plain old acceleration of gravity, and those slight change in symbolisms really don't mean anything. It's just sort of traditional. Now, potential energy is the energy has something um, stored in its position. So whenever you lift an object, you're doing work against gravity. So let's say I have a small child, and this small child is going to climb up the ladder boom, 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 and stand on the top of the ladder. Now, the child did work against gravity. The muscles of the child exerted a force through some sort of a displacement x from top to bottom, and that is now stored as potential energy at the top of the slide. Now, here's one of the things that's kind of nifty. The equation for potential energy is height times mass times acceleration of gravity. Well, how much work did the kid do climbing up to the top of the slide? Well, the kid had to move 10, excuse me, x displacement, and x is the same as height h, so these two are the same. And because the child was working against gravity, the child had to exert a force equal to at least their mass times the acceleration of gravity. So this and this, the work done, is exactly equal to the potential energy stored. So the work put in is now in the form of stored position energy. When the small child then goes zooming down, as a happy kid going down the uh, slide, what happens is energy of position then transforms into kinetic energy, energy of motion out the other end. Now, is all of the energy transformed come 100% from potential into kinetic? And the answer is yes, it would be if we can ignore friction. And sometimes we are going to pretend we can, and sometimes, honestly, we can, because friction is very small. I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid going down the slide, there always seemed to be friction between my hiney and the slide. And so friction itself is going to cause some loss of energy, and lost energy due to friction gets transformed into heat. So work is done, energy is stored, that energy is transformed, a little bit is lost, and then the whole thing can start over. And every once in a while, you got to feed the kid to power him so he can keep going round and round and round. Another example of potential energy in these energy transformations is roller coasters. Most roller coasters have a big, what they refer to as a lift hill. The lift hill is how they give the cars and the people an awful lot of potential energy.
Now, when you're sitting on a roller coaster, you always hear that sound, that click, 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 click. There's a big chain drive that is moving you to the top of the hill. And then when you get to the point that you're about to go over the other side, it gets quiet. And it gets quiet because they disengage that chain and you are freewheeling. From the beginning of the ride to the end of the ride, you are powered by nothing but gravity. And roller coasters are fabulous examples of energy transformations. Potential energy is transformed into kinetic energy, kinetic into potential, potential into kinetic, kinetic into potential, and potential back into kinetic. It is a constant shuffle back and forth from height into speed, speed into height, back and forth like that. A um, couple more things about roller coasters. One of the things is roller coasters, when you go to a any sort of a uh, amusement park, they have a tendency to be twisted in upon themselves so you start and end at the same spot. But if you could take a roller coaster and you could draw the path out like this, one of the things you're going to notice is that the hills never are as high as the first hill. The other thing that you might notice is often the biggest tricks are in the beginning. So why do they typically have the biggest motions in the beginning and the hills tend to get can progressively lower because there is friction and friction is constantly transforming this energy into heat and so the coaster car is continuously losing energy. Why do they have the big tricks in the beginning? Well, usually they take an awful lot of velocity. And if you try and do a big loop-to-loop -loop towards the end, you're not going to have enough speed left because friction has been bleeding energy off. Now, there are some coasters that do wild and crazy things. I'm thinking about, um, there's one at Universal Studios down in Florida that actually they have a big pneumatic or air cannon. They don't take you up the lift hill. They start you out down here someplace, and they shoot you out of the cannon, and you come out and you go, wee, and you go through your first loop-to-loop. But instead of giving you potential energy, they give you a whole bunch of kinetic energy to begin with. Last thing about coasters that are kind of fun, and that is at the end of the ride, there is always a little incline back to the loading house where they're actually going to put you into and out of the cars. So what is that incline in the loading house used for? Yeah, the purpose is to slow you down. They don't want to apply the brakes when you're going really, really fast. So they put you up a little bit of an incline, so you're going just a few meters per second. Then they tap the brakes, take everybody out, refill the whole thing yeah, up, send them up the lift hill, and the whole thing keeps going round and round again. All right, ladies and gents, that will do for this time. And we'll come back, we're going to do some math with conservation of energy.